So up first, we have robust, repeatable, and interoperable workflows through IMF Output Profile List. With me to talk about that, I have Raymond Young, who is the senior researcher at Dolby, and Arjun Ramamurthy, who is the SVP at 20th Century Fox. And they have really long, lovely bios if you want to read about them online. So please help me welcome Raymond. He's going to come up and talk. All right, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for staying late uh, to see us. Really appreciate it. And uh, to kick off the session, uh, we're going to, the panel, we're going to look at uh, the pathway to a robust, repeatable, and interoperable workflows. Of course, hopefully fully automated with the IMF um, output profile list. A quick outline, uh, just say a quick warning that we are not going to quite go quite linearly in the program because at points, uh, you know, IMF is um, not that complicated, but a lot of concepts are subtle, so we'll try to illustrate uh, each concept as we go uh, clearly. So we, roughly speaking, we're going to do some introductions uh, to, the, to the problems at hand, um, and then uh, we'll look at IMF itself, um, how it's put together for the ones who are not familiar yet. And then, of course, go into our output profile list, see what this thing is, um, look at advantage, limitations, and how do we move towards automation. And then, what's the next step that we need to do to bring uh, our designs into reality in the f near future, and quickly conclude. Uh, what problem are we trying to solve? And it's a common consideration when we go into uh, standard document developments. And so we ask ourselves, what is the problem at hand? And basically, uh, thank goodness for the world, the audience, they love media coming out of Hollywood and all around the world. And uh, with the proliferation like streaming, a lot of bandwidth go towards video, so everybody wants our stuff. And um, so it's a good problem to have to how to feed all that uh, thirst or hunger for media. And all around the world, so we have to look, you know, quickly adjust uh, to supply a different version, a different language, uh, localized territories. Um, Typically, they, a lot of time, the, me, the, uh, the titles, the movie or TV shows also come with you know, different cuts, uh, edits uh, for localized territories. And we kind of call it versionitis, ouch. <laughs> and, um, and the composition playlist really is a uh, design to address that. And also, uh, in addition to many versions and for different audiences for the same title, there's also uh, many different formats that the output um, need to be produced. For example, different bit rates for different purpose, uh, mobile, typically lower bit rates, and uh, all the way to um, UHD, for example, Blu-rays, recently, uh, highest quality, and live broadcast as well, linear broadcast. So the question really is, to solve these, these problems, we have to ask the IMF, um, look to IMF frameworks. Say, can this system actually provide uh, correct and consistent endpoints um, uh, delivery to the endpoint? And also, can servicing be actually be efficiently done with um, single, a single mezzanine, ideally. So quick introduction to IMF. Uh, really, it's a modular approach. The IMF uh, development came, uh, is, took a lot of knowledge and learning from digital cinema, and then uh, extended uh, further for flexibilities. So there's a set of core components 
And the first one is called the core constraints, which are the, the most basic uh, uh, requirements for deliveries, for packaging, media. And then the composition playlist, which exists also in digital cinema. It provides timelines, uh, support, especially in terms of versioning. And then essence, uh, that's where the content of video, audio, uh, subtitle, captions, or any other data would be um, encapsulated in. And uh, there's also a component to help audio labeling for a vast uh, number of audio configurations. And finally, output profile list. We'll go deeper into that. And so based on the foundational components, a set of application has been generated. And here's a list of pretty much all the application that is exist. And go to the next slide. And um, to sort of further illustrate the idea of building up from components, which for the typical delivery of media, in the bottom is the timeline. There are tracks, which are the essence, video, audio contents that we would watch and hear. And, uh, and also, there are some administrative items, such as a packing list, which tells you what's in the package, and then asset map, kind of like an address book to try to help you find, locate all the different pieces, um, especially the video and audio tracks. And recently, also, some extra stuff is added. Uh, it's called sidecars. For example, QC reports. Um, you know, all the deliveries has to be examined. Um, most of the time by human, and if there's any issues, it is uh, flagged in sidecar. And in the middle part uh, is an illustration of the IMF core, the foundational component. And they're all with the, you know, I wouldn't go into the numbers, they're all in a SIMT uh, standard series 2067. And then at the top, the applications are built. It's very similar to uh, software constructions. And at the top end, we have the apps serve different purposes. And uh, you know, through the years, quite a few applications has been developed, uh, especially recently, uh, Apple joined forces uh, in IMF and produced the uh, ProRes application, supply uh, video in progress. And then the uh, European Broadcast uh, Organization, DPP, the Production Partnership, also jump in. Have a, looks like an older version, is should say TSP. And I beg the pardon of our standard vice president. <laughs> and 2121 is the very first experimentation of a uh, technical spec, and that actually refers to the Apple progress. So just to give a little bit of context of what IMF does, what does this composition, you know, what all this that means, and how this all come together. And um, a typical example is for a TV show. Uh, there is a, say a, uh, since this is an American production, there is a uh, English video. And in order to localize for other territories, and in this example, there's French, Spanish, and Italian. I apologize to our chair, Max, that the Italian audio seems to be missing, but it will reappear. Um, just to illustrate the flexibility of IMF. <laughs> and um, the composition playlist really plays the role of assembling um, the, all the pieces together. Uh, typically, for a language version, uh, there would be you know, the very thin black lines indicate removal of certain scenes uh, that is probably not appropriate, or in a TV show, it could be commercial blacks, and other countries may not need to provide commercials. And then the um, sort of burgundy reddish bars uh, indicate inserts of specific text language, texting language, and uh, which you could probably see if you're close enough, um, there's French text, Spanish text, and Italian text. Again, thanks to our 
session chair Max, who speaks my Italian. In fact, it did happen often that uh, even a version is done, you could see misspellings. Again, IMF is flexible enough to just replace a certain piece. And towards the right side, uh, once a CPL um, is parsed, and then the OPL comes in that can drive transcode engines to produce, in this example, and magically the Italian uh, audio came back. Right. And we use the French version as an example. And uh, as I mentioned before, the Endpoint uh, format could be different, uh, even if they are just uh, streams for the audience to watch. For example, at the top, there's ProRes, uh, is, is one transcode, and then in the middle, there's a 50 megabit MPEG-2, uh, used to be common for broadcast um, purpose. And then at the bottom, uh, there's uh, HLS for streaming. So again, coming from a single um, source, which is the picture at the bottom. And with re audio repla replacement tracks, as well as inserts, and can be transcoded into three different or more outputs. So what does that tell us? Uh, basically, and as we'll dive in a little deeper, in the OPL, the, the key component of the OPL is a CPL, which is a um, timeline for the title. And so based on the CPL, many versions can be generated. And then in the OPL also have uh, processing instructions. Therefore, it can basically specify the different outputs. Um, as we saw earlier. So why, well, how does it benefit content owners? And uh, number one is outboard processing. The, I like the word outboard because, for example, um, we used to do processing in a single platform, such as an encoding engine in a box. And nowadays, cloud is the big, you know, we hear all about it. and. We have a fairly generic term, but outboard means you could basically process anywhere on your network, in a box, in separate boxes, in different components, and, um, and then a lot of customization can also be supported. As we all know, you know, each content owner have their preferences in terms of uh, their specification. And this is a little bit outdated version and there shouldn't be a blank line in bullet points. So we're looking at a um, custom color transform, uh, maybe some dithering process that may help the encoding engine and uh, example, and then uh, crop or scale, which is common in image reformatting and audio channel uh, can also be. So now since we touched on OPL, we're gonna jump into the OPL operations. Again, following the same concept as the sort of building up from component to applications, the OPL systems also build on the core component from the foundation. And there are four different uh, documents in OPL that has been, uh, actually, there are more now, but um, the four documents has been around for a while to basically uh, very, very clearly and specifically specify the outputting, uh, output generation process, and uh, also some definition for image and uh, basic macros. In audio routing, there's a macro. Um, sound is at least half of the picture. And uh, as well as some uh, uh, pixel color representation. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So pulling back, looking from a IMF package perspective, um, a package typically contains a manifest. Well, of course, the most important components are the essence, and uh, which is indicated in this diagram of the three video 
real track, or uh, one real for each track, and then the audio as an example. And the composition playlist sitting in the middle basically ties all the essence together. And then uh, to help the, for administrative purpose, especially for orchestrating um, to manage these packages, manifest, which is a list of everything in the package, as well as a kind of like an address book directory, which kind of provide a mapping. Uh, whenever there is a unique ID, and where is or how is the, uh, the physical, the tracks, all the pieces are is linked together, is referenced. And finally, um, we come to a part where there's processing instruction, which is actually the OPL that we are focusing. And typically, delivery don't go all at once. And uh, different version, for example, could be separate. Uh, and I just want to point out real quick that uh, here we kind of use a symbol of files and folders, but IMF, the standards itself, does not specify how you would organize it. It's very flexible, so all, every user have their own preferences, so they can do their own uh, configuration. So jumping into OPL, uh, there are require components. Of course, everything in a package or in the IMF system have to be able to, uh, have to be uniquely identified. Therefore, there's a unique identifier. And it's also crucial, we must have a composition to go with the operations. And therefore, there's a CPL ID reference in there as well. And optionally, there are many descriptive fields help uh, human understanding of what, what, these, uh, what the instructions are. And there are aliases who are nicknames for to specify input output, help put together uh, kind of uh, processing pipelines, processing steps. And um, interestingly, at this point, the operator list is actually optional. And uh, however, if one wants to do uh, processing, required to have that piece in the package. And a little bit about the operation operator list, it is a ordered list to be executed step by step. It is very clearly and unambiguously stated in the standard. The operator looks, uh, we'll have an illustration of that in a moment, and the operators are in a very strict order listed in the uh, OPL structure. There's no uh, uh, variation in terms of processing, and each step has to be completed, one after another. And currently, we have a set of operators that are standardized. And I um, would like to draw your attention to uh, the preset macro. It's an interesting object because the preset macros, each OPL only allowed one. If this macro is used, this is the one. Um, there cannot be two of these or more than one of these. So what it does is basically, uh, it does a very simple thing. It has a little name, uh, generically it's an URI. So it could be a file name, it could be just a, uh, a just a name string is a token that can evoke an action. And it turns out to be very useful in terms of um, you know, experimenting and prototyping workflow. And the um, preset macro actually will come back, not only in this discussion, but probably in the following presentation. So real quick, um, just a quick summary of the advantage um, that the, des the design of this framework provides is everything is standardized. And uh, so the structure of the OPL completely standardized and um, we're under very strict um, rules. So validation is very straightforward. 
and also uh, the composition timeline, which is essential to each package, is also very, very clearly specified. Therefore, again, validation is straightforward. And the operators are standardized to the level of their algorithms, um, which I have one illustration, uh, actually a couple of examples that we can quickly look at. And because of that, so for the same input into the operations, the output will always be the same. Therefore, it's consistent and independent of the system that is processing with, or the configuration of the, configuration of the system, or the infrastructure. And the first example is a crop macro. And I would like to quickly point out that this macro basically extract a, an, uh, an area within an image and then make a new image, output a new image. Um, the drawing laid out on, the, on your left side um, is the input parameters. So you can specify what you want to do with the input, parameter, uh, in the input image based on these parameters. For example, in the crop, you would want to specify where your area of interest or the extraction area would be. And then on output, um, actually the designer of this macro uh, is very clever. It's included a padding mechanism. So you could actually do image padding, like letterboxing or filler boxing in one go. And the output parameters are on, it's attached to the output image sequence. Um, so again, the model of input parameters, output parameters, and processing, very specifically defined in the standards. There's no and, if, or, but about it. The next, ex next example is the image scale macro. So this basically take an image and resize. For example, uh, UHD to HD, vice versa. Again, input image sequence with the input image parameters, and in this case is not none, and the output parameters uh, of width and height of the output image, new sizing. Uh, with, in terms of uh, when image get resized, a filter typically is applied to optimize um, the visual. So an algorithm parameter is provided here, and in the specific standard uh, in SIMTI, this algorithm, um, there's only one algorithm, which is the Lancho's filter, is specified. Uh, all the mathematics are stated in the standard document. So the implementation to follow, uh, if the implementation were to follow that, then again, for a fixed input, the same output will always result. And next example is a combination of the crop and scale. And in this case, uh, this is a sort of a visual display of the XML file, which is the OPL itself. And uh, again, you know, we don't want to dwell on the exact uh, structure of this document, but um, we would focus on the uh, processing pipeline. And this one take a crop and then scale. However, the scaling uh, operation needed uh, a conversion of the pixel representation into a normalized format so that um, the, the processing would be optimal. Again, uh, a step-by-step -step of this operator chain, one after another. Um, finally, I just want to flash this. We won't go into any detail. This is uh, about the dynamic metadata for color volume transform uh, came from the HDR work that SIMT has done. And the idea is to generate uh, SDR, uh, standard dynamic range, uh, kind of like standard HDTV deliverables out of your HDR master, high dynamic range master. And the only couple of things I want to point out is that there are many boxes and they're all in one line. There's no branch, no uh, uh, if options, anything like that. So that brings us to a point of what are the limitations of OPL? Not perfect, 
And for example, the previous slide showed the, uh, the long pipeline has no branch. So only straightforward processing, uh, one process after another, no branching. So parallel processing within an OPL, uh, a one pipeline is not possible. However, that could still be accomplished by launching or processing multiple OPL. And currently, as you notice, I only have like two or three examples, and that's uh, actually, altogether there are six operators, and there's way too few. So more need to be developed. Uh, it's also shown in the last previous slide with many boxes. And then uh, subsample processing is also is implicit, not explicit. There's no uh, explicit definition for um, working in subsampled images. And uh, also the extra stuff like sidecar, there's no obvious way to reference uh, from the OPL framework. And of course, to grow the system, to be able to reuse already built OPL, validated OPL would be good. So an include mechanism would be nice. Or like in programming concept is like inheritance. And uh, finally, um, another issue that we can think of is as the number of these operators grow, a registry of them would be very nice. And just quickly show you a possible orchestration, uh, a, a workflow orchestrated uh, through OPL. It started with an OPL. And yeah, I want to highlight the, uh, the once the OPL is validated, as we mentioned before, it could be done very in a very straightforward manner. You locate all the asset, then you can schedule the resources, and you process, and you deliver. Very simple workflow. This workflow can be replicated for each output format in terms of bitrate, codecs, and so on and so forth. And of course, stop on error. My slide has no color and just a red box saying stop on error. It will, this provision can save a lot of time and resource uh, in terms of failed processing. So what do we do next? Um, obviously, we have to check the interoperability of the standard as well as you know, all the implementations. And currently, there's Pluckfest going on in SIMT as well as a very active uh, IMF user group um, to basically testing all these concepts of automated workflows. And a lot of focus is put on experimentation with encoding. Um, like our example with the pictures, different uh, format output to be delivered. Um, that could be a huge um, win automation. And we start with the preset macro. And then uh, there's been a proposal on a named parameter macro. So basically, whatever encoding parameter that is common and necessary if uh, flexibility, we would have a macro that you can set these parameters. And of course, um, a lot of people are prototyping these custom uh, work, their custom workflows, and uh, the IMF community is very active looking into aspect. And um, based on prototype use case, you know, further standardization. Um, uh, is needed. Uh, there's a set of suggested para uh, uh, operators such as color space conversion, LUTs, and matrix, and, and image filtering. And then, of course, we all need to jump in it. We need you to participate in this effort. And in conclusion, very quickly, um, the SIMT standard provides a solid foundation for OPL. Uh, function with interoperability and repeatability. Adoption by the owners, uh, content owners, like IMF user group, ongoing, and uh, of course with systematic uh, testing. Well, so all this will result robust, repeatable, and interoperable automated workflow for all. Thank you. We have 36 we have, seconds for... Yes, for one questions. question, go ahead. Questions?
mentioned uh, complete packages. Can you tell us a little bit more about complete packages versus partial packages? Oh, yes. Um, as I mentioned before, the, you know, the IMF framework does not involve itself with, um, with uh, asset management systems. So the package that's delivered you know, could be complete. That means everything that you needed to generate an output um, or for a timeline or a certain version. Or it could be partial. For example, later delivery with a different ver uh, with a uh, new language version or new editorial version could be just some um, inserts and, um, and new audios and a new composition playlist. Um, without the main video, uh, which is usually heavy, high, res uh, you know, high quality, high bit rate. And, um, and so those would be partial. And in fact, you know, after some experience working with uh, IMF packaging, um, the, you know, the, the, there's a huge variability of partial packages. And, um, and once we gain enough experience, and the user community will share you know, some pointers you know, with the rest of the world. Question? My background is a software engineer developer. So uh, I used to work in Disney and uh, uh, Interactive Studios. So we actually, we, we have some work, uh, gaming workflow as well. Initially, we implemented in XML format, which of course is standard. And it took us lots of effort and it's very cumbersome to define the gaming workflow. So eventually, actually, we switched all this to JavaScript engine. Uh, another example is that um, the, my, my, my concern with using XML in the wrong uh, context that uh, XML is uh, good for, uh, you know, transport the documents. But here, when you talk about OPL, you try to use it applied to some uh, workflow engine. I feel like it's probably it's not the right tool. So another example is a Java um, developer myself. Java used to use an, uh, Maven as a main uh, uh, package or de deployment tool. But then we actually, people right now switch to Gradle, which is a Groovy type language, scripting language uh, uh, engine. So, so you, as, as, as I can see here is that we, we better use the right tool for the, for the right application. So here, I, and my concern is probably XML is not the right, form, right tool here. Yes, and I understand your question, and really it's about right tool for the yeah. right work. The right in, tool, yeah. Yes, in, uh, in terms of, because again, all the advantage, all the consistency, interoperability, all came from um, standardization. And XML is a very common, uh, language for standardization and therefore really? you know it's a common operating point of course and that's why there are a lot of flexibility in this system you know simply does not or the standards does not specify how you would actually implement your encoding engine so it could be a translation process that go into your native uh, you know encoding uh, configuration for example and i hope that helps yeah I I think so. <laughs> You're gonna take it? Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simti.org. We'll see you next time.